from extraordinary claims to secret government facilities. Here's how Bob Lazar exposes Area 51. Before we begin, be sure to subscribe to They Will Kill You. Hit the like button and request any topics you'd like to learn about in the comments section below. Number 11. Who is Bob Lazar? Robert Lazar is an alleged scientist and one of the world's best-known UFO whistleblowers. In the late 1980s, he gave a series of interviews in which he claimed to have worked at a top-secret government facility where he was introduced to alien flying saucers. According to Lazar, he was selected to work on the aircraft in order to back-engineer its propulsion system. The technology was reportedly far more advanced than anything humanity was capable of at the time and perhaps since. Lazar has been unwavering in his story for over three decades, which has earned him a number of supporters and critics alike. The scientific community generally views his claims with skepticism, pointing out that they lack solid evidence and that they mostly hinge on Lazar's word. It's worth mentioning that the information we're about to go through generally comes from Lazar himself and the investigative reports into his story. Before we move on, official They Will Kill You merchandise is now available at theywillkillyou.com. It's out of this world. Number 10, Early Life. According to Lazar's friends and family, he'd shown an interest in science from a very young age. As a child, he would make his own fireworks, a passion that followed him into adulthood. Most of those close to him support his claims of being a scientist as well as his knowledge of electronics, chemistry, physics, jet engines and combustion engines. Since 1987, before he started working at S4, Lazar and his friend Gene Huff ran an annual festival called Desert Blast in the Nevada desert. It features rockets, homemade explosives, jet-powered vehicles and other pyrotechnics. In fact, Bob Lazar's story begins with an article in the Los Alamos Monitor about how he'd put a jet engine on his Honda CRX. Before we move on, answer this question. What pseudonym did Bob Lazar use the first time he addressed the general public on his highly classified work? A. Joe B. Dennis C. Jack D. Steve Let us know what you think in the comments section below and stay tuned to find out the right answer. Number 9. Education Controversy On paper, Bob Lazar took some electronics courses at Pierce Junior College in Los Angeles during the late 1970s. He claims to have a master's degree in electronic technology from the California Institute of Technology and a master's in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The degrees would give his claims of being a scientist the necessary legitimacy but there are no records of him attending either Caltech or MIT. In fact, he doesn't appear to have been a member of any professional body. Lazar suspects that his records were erased by government branches who sought to discredit him. Number 8. Employment Controversy Another controversial aspect was his employment at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. The official position is that he never worked there. However, the article in the Los Alamos Monitor, which included a front-page picture of Lazar and his jet engine Honda, listed him as a physicist at the laboratory. Moreover, he was also listed in the lab's employee and contractor phone directory, which confirms his employment at the facility. Number 7. Recruitment In 1982 at Los Alamos, Lazar approached Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb and a scientific consultant to a number of US presidents. Coincidentally, at the time, Teller was reading the very article with Lazar's picture on its front page. After Lazar introduced himself, the two had a brief conversation about jet engines. Years later, Lazar wanted to get back into the scientific field. He sent resumes to various laboratories and included Edward Teller on the list. Teller remembered Lazar and told him to contact someone at EG&G defense contractor in Nevada with access to some of the government's most sensitive technologies. Lazar reportedly dazzled his EG&G interviewers and was eventually hired to work on a propulsion project in an outer area. He subsequently met a man named Dennis Mariani and was flown to Area 51 at Groom Lake. Lazar reportedly waived his constitutional rights and agreed 
to complete secrecy and a rigorous monitoring process. Afterwards, a bus with blacked out windows took him and Mariani to the S4 facility near Papoose Lake. Lazar has always maintained having no idea about why he'd been selected for the top secret project. Some of his supporters believe it was a combination of attention from his propulsion experiments and Edward Teller's recommendation. Number 6. Lazar's Work at S4 S4 was a facility built in the side of a mountain that featured a number of hangars and buildings. It's here that Lazar was introduced to his lab partner, a man he only identified as Barry, who'd been there longer. Lazar first started to realize that he was working with extraterrestrial technology when he was exposed to a reactor from a flying saucer. It was a sphere about the size of a basketball on a metal plate. It produced a gravitational field via contact with the plate. Barry asked Lazar to put his hands on it and he couldn't touch it. The consensus was and is that humans don't have the technology capable of producing gravity. Lazar suspects that his predecessor had died during a desperate experiment where they were trying to cut into the reactor. Lazar worked at S4 for roughly six months, from 1988 to 1989, and his job was to figure out how to duplicate the alien technology with available materials. According to him, he made virtually no progress during his time there. The activity taking place at S4 was extremely compartmentalized, meaning that Lazar didn't get to interact with others and wasn't aware of their progress either. He did, however, receive briefings and an overview of the project. From these documents, he learned that in the past 10,000 years, technologically superior extraterrestrial beings have been involved with the Earth. They're believed to have come from the twin binary star system, Zeta Reticuli, about 39.3 light years from our planet. Lazar doesn't know how the government came in possession of the crafts. He claimed at one point seeing a small gray bean standing between two men in lab coats as he was passing by a window. He only caught a slight glimpse before his armed escort told him to keep his eyes forward. Number 5. Flying Saucers Bob Lazar saw nine flying saucers, all of different shapes and build, during his time at S4. This only happened once when the hangar doors were all open. He believes that several of them were still operational. Nevertheless, he only got to work on one, which he dubbed Sport Model. His job was to try and reverse engineer its power and propulsion system. Lazar got to see the interior of the flying disc once. He describes it as having no right angles and that it looked like it was fused together, as if it was made out of melted wax. There was no wiring connecting the components and they worked by being in proximity to each other. The interior was made for a being smaller than a human. Sport model was shaped like a flying disc of about 52 feet in diameter, constructed from unknown materials. Lazar got to witness a test flight on one occasion. Because sport model wasn't bound by gravity, it moved in unconventional ways and reportedly had the ability of distorting light and space and time. Number 4. Lazar and George Knapp Frustrated by the secrecy of his job, Lazar, who was in his 20s at the time, had a rebellious moment against S4. He told a few of his friends, including Gene Huff, what was really going on and took them to the desert to witness an S4 UFO test flight. On a Wednesday night, they saw a remarkable display in which a bright glowing disc jumped in flashes across the Nevada night sky and even got really close to them. Bob and his friends tried to repeat the experience a week later, but were encircled by security. The military personnel told them that even though they were on public land, they were approaching a government facility and that they should move back to the highway. Because he'd broken the secrecy, Bob Lazar's position at S4 was compromised. His security clearance was revoked and he began to fear for his life. Lazar went on TV in silhouette to tell the world about what was happening in central Nevada. At some point later, his back tire was shot out. In an effort to protect himself, Lazar decided to work with George Knapp to expose the story. Knapp, an award-winning investigative journalist, has remained one of Lazar's most loyal supporters. Recent interest in Bob Lazar's story comes from a Netflix documentary entitled Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers. His appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience alongside the documentary's director, Jeremy Corbell, has also reignited public interest into his story. Number 3. Element 115 
Element 115 is the linchpin of Lazar's story and the factor that seems to give his claims validity. In 1989, Lazar said that Sport Model's antimatter reactor was fueled by atomic element 115. This element wouldn't be successfully synthesized until 2003 by a joint team of Russian and American scientists known as Moscovium, an extremely radioactive element that even in its most stable forms has a half-life of less than a second. Lazar knew about it roughly 15 years earlier. There's also the aspect of gravity waves. In the late 1980s, the knowledge was that gravity moves through particles known as gravitons. Lazar claimed he learned from the disk power source that gravity moves in waves, which was also later determined to be true. Then there's an identity-confirming device which Lazar talked about, and many were quick to discredit as science fiction in the late 1980s. It was a rudimentary biometrics device that confirmed a person's identity by shining a light through their palm and measuring the bone distance in the fingers. Its existence was also later confirmed. Number 2. Motivation Lazar says that he came forward in order to protect himself as he noticed that aspects of his life were being erased. He felt that he needed to do something before he disappeared altogether. On the Joe Rogan experience, Lazar talked about how the decision has affected him. Branches of government have been harassing him, his friends and his family. Strangers have been showing up to his house wanting to talk to him about his experiences. His business, United Nuclear Scientific Equipment and Supplies, has also become a target, raided by various government agencies. The suspicion among Lazar's supporters is that he took some Element 115 with him during his time at S4 and the government is still trying to recover it. Lazar went to great lengths to prove to the world that he's telling the truth. He passed four polygraph tests and even underwent hypnosis to try and remember more about his time at S4. Some believe Lazar while others think he's a fraud, a hoaxer or the victim of a government mind control program. So what pseudonym did Bob Lazar use the first time he addressed the public on his findings? If you chose B, Dennis, then you're right. In May 1989, Lazar concealed his identity and used the pseudonym during a first public interview with George Knapp for a Las Vegas TV station called KLAS. Number 1. Area 51 Regardless of where you stand when it comes to Bob Lazar's story, one aspect is indisputable, which is that he was the first to expose Area 51 to the general public. The highly classified US Air Force facility located within the Nevada desert was publicly acknowledged by the CIA in June 2013 under a Freedom of Information Act request. Its official names, according to the CIA, are Groom Lake and Homey Airport. When Lazar talked about Area 51 in 1989, Many were quick to deny its existence as a secret facility. Area 51's primary purpose is still unknown to the public, but speculations based on its history include the testing of highly classified weapon systems and experimental aircrafts. If Bob Lazar's story is ever conclusively proven, then experimenting with alien technology can be added to the list. It would be without a doubt the greatest find in our collective history and a long-awaited answer to the question are we alone in the universe? Thanks for watching. Would you rather make contact with an extraterrestrial being or learn to pilot an alien spacecraft? Let us know in the comments section below.